In the last episode, we have already used Cezanne's painting of Montaigne Saint Victor to explain the structuralist in him. In episode nine and ten, we saw Monet used loaded brushes and prime colors to illustrate light. For Cezanne, he used the verb construct to describe the act we normally call painting. Instead of trying to catch the fleeting moments, Cezanne spent months on a painting looking for that exact structural and color balance. Nature for him was a source for ideas. We have seen that his paintings have a certain texture. Things tend to have similar sizes, echoing everything else on the painting. The problem with this kind of arrangement is that if he found something wrong in a later stage, he could not simply change it, because the change would break some other balance and beget more changes. Likewise, the additional changes would beget further additional changes. In the end, a small change was likely to force him to repaint everything. For Monet, all he needed to make sure was that the colors were in balance overall. In other words, if he found too much of something, say red, he could simply tone it down, or reduce the sizes of the red flowers, and bring the entire painting back to balance. For instance, if the red flowers were painted last, as it was often the case, he could always use the saturation, size, and placement of the flowers to accomplish balance of the entire painting. For Cezanne, since he was restricted by his structures, that method did not work for him. When he got completely frustrated, unable to bring balance, he would have to abandon the entire project. Like the unfinished one we saw in the last episode. That's why he furiously destroyed so many canvases. We also talked in the last episode about those Cezanne landscapes that have become standard affairs. Thanks to Cezanne, many painters today could have careers using Cezanne's formulas in their locations to produce something impressive enough for vacationers to part with their money. In this episode, we shall take a deeper look at the structures of Cezanne in an effort to demonstrate his greatness. Take a quick look at this painting. Which apple did your eyes fall on first? I bet it is either the yellow one on the top left, or the one in the bottom middle. Normally, our eyes fall on the brightest among many. After you spend some time on the first apple, what was the next thing you look at to make the transition smoother? We see that Cezanne created transition zones between the apples. Look at the two apples at the lower left. Without the transition zone, they would look like this. Cezanne's transition zones made it much easier for the eyes to move from one apple to another. When our eyes move smoothly from yellow to red, and then back to yellow, and so on, the painting gives us the consecutiveness for our eyes to move about. When we look at all the apples simultaneously, we see that the upper part is essentially yellow, red, yellow, and the lower part red, yellow, red. Altogether, we see two triangles interlocking each other. This overall structure gives the painting simultaneity, which makes the painting look balanced when we look at the entire painting together, such as from some distance away. Consecutiveness and simultaneity in both structure and color together give this painting balance. The light blue in the back, complementing the colors of the apples, brightens up the apples a bit. This extra touch. Is an old impressionist trick that we have already discussed in episode ten. To make sure that the painting was not made too shiny by the blue background, Cezanne painted some areas quite dirty. Since the dirtiness also provided transition and consecutiveness, it was one stone for two birds. 
A final comment on simultaneity: If we change the color of one of the apples, the simultaneity balance will be lost. Let's look at some more apples. Look at this thing, whatever it is. Is it possible for these two edges to be parallel, and these two to be this much off? This table edge, which seems to be moving down. Disappears on the other end of the tablecloth. Let's look at the right side of the table. The surface definitely seems leaning towards us. Of course, leaning towards us does not work with a basket on the left. So instead of moving the basket around, probably he could not find any way. Cezanne moved the table edge. I'm going to put the image up there a little bit longer for you to think about the consecutiveness and simultaneity. Before we leave this painting, I want to point out one more thing. Take a look at the wine bottle. Do you realize that it is not vertical? Actually, if you pay attention to his other paintings, you would find that is almost always the case. The tilting wine bottle complements the table surface, since the tilting table surface will give the sensation of apples rolling towards left. Cezanne was forced to use this step structure. Weird, right? Yet the painting looks balanced and attractive. I'm going to leave the painting up a little bit longer so you could enjoy this complex structure. Now let's take a look at another apple painting. Do the apples look like about to roll off the edge? This is the first painting of Montan Saint Victor we showed in the last episode. After the discussion about the consecutiveness and simultaneity, do you see the greatness of this painting? Pick a spot that comes natural to you, and let the painting lead your eyes around. Do you realize how natural and smooth this happens? Do you feel a sensation of naturalness? It is definitely different from impressionism, but so much more natural, would you say? This is the second Montan Saint Victor painting we showed in the last episode. Pay attention to the simultaneity this time. The surface of the ground appears to be leaning towards us. For this to happen naturally, the vantage point of the painter has to be pretty high. We know that Cezanne painted on the ground level, and not in the air. Also, pay attention to the texture. So we see the subjects of the paintings, either apples or Montan Saint Victor. Are almost incidental. The effort to form a balance is the same. In other words, if we hang good art on our walls and look at it from time to time, 
It will help us make our lives more coherent. So beyond what Ruskin said about great art reflecting our time better than anything else, I think our lives will be made better by looking at good art. And for people living in today's world, the art that makes the most impact to us should not be those painted ages ago, reflecting another time and another world, but something produced contemporaneously, reflecting our own time. That is probably the importance. Or to use a French phrase, raison d'être, of modern art, or to be more specific, what is called contemporary art, the art produced in our age, and the reason for us to spend time to understand it, appreciate it, and let it enrich our lives. I'll see you next time.